while we're continuing through the Gospel of Mark, would you open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We'll be reading verse 29 through 34. Mark chapter 1. The word of the Lord says this. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed with demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Let's pray one more time and ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord, we're about to come to the preaching of your word. Lord, the very <clears throat> nourishment <clears throat> that we need is from your word. This means of grace to be built up by the preaching of your word is about to begin, Lord. Lord, would you help me and equip me, Lord, to preach truth, to preach rightly and accurately and correctly, Lord, not just as theological dogma, Lord, but as real experiential theology for the hearts, for the minds, and for the hands of your people, Lord. Lord, would you help your people to hear the word preached, to savor the word preached, and to then implement that word that was preached. And Lord, would you help those, Lord, who are unbelievers, Lord, to hear this morning, as, as the word says, Lord, he who has an ear, let him hear. But Lord, we all have ears. But the reality is, Lord, unless you open up our spiritual ears, we, we will not be able to understand those spiritual things, Lord. So regardless of where we are, Lord, the reality is that all of us need to hear about Christ this morning. For it is he that we truly need. Help us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You know, one of the best features of what I would say John MacArthur's testimony, his 50 years of being in ministry, isn't so much some of his doctrines that I would disagree with, isn't so much the fact that he's even been at one church for 50 years, isn't even that he's preached through the entire Bible for 50 years and now starting over. Those are great, respectable things. But those aren't the things that make John MacArthur's ministry special. To be, a some sense... Of, of noteworthy uh, vision, to, to, to see him as, as a great man in that sense. What makes his ministry special is that you ask his children, you ask those who knew him at a personal level, was John MacArthur the same man in the home that he was in the pulpit? Did he practice what he preached? When he stepped in the pulpit, did you see a man trying to put on a facade to impress the religious, to impress Christians, to impress Reformed people, and then go home and be angry and impatient and, and unkind to his family. No, what we find is his children, all those who know him personally, who he is in the pulpit, that man that you see on the stage in the public eye, as it were, is the same man that we know behind closed doors, if not even more loving, more gracious, more kind, more patient in the home. And what we're going to find today is Christ in private. Christ in the home is who he, is, who he was in the pulpit, who he was preaching. Remember last week we, we read about Christ preaching and the synagogue was astonished at his preaching, amazed at his preaching. And then he goes and he heals that demon-possessed man. And yet now what we find is Christ in the home. Is he going to be different? Is he going to begin to say, okay, I preached, I healed that man, now let me just relax, and you guys start to begin to serve me. You guys begin to start to bring me food and, and, and wash my feet. No, what we find is that Christ is the same in the pulpit at home. The same. If not even more loving, if not even growing more tired at, at home than he is in the pulpit. Let's read verse 29 again. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Still the Sabbath. This is still the same day that we read about last week. He was preaching in the morning, and now they leave the Sabbath, and now they go home. 
They go home, and what's going to happen is healing on the Sabbath. Well, we know that the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Jews of the day would have thought that that was breaking the Sabbath. But there's none present, there's none here, so what we, we find is Christ still healing people on the Sabbath. But some, something of, of, of to be quickly a- analyzed, what we're going to do this morning is going to be a little bit different than, than most Sundays. We're going to give a brief exposition of a verse and a quick application, because there's, there's just so much to go, go through here, but then we'll end on a meditation of Christ. So what we find here is Christ leaving the synagogue the same day he's about to heal on the Sabbath, and he's in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. You see, remember last week, or a couple weeks ago, sorry, Christ had commanded, come, follow me, leave, leave what you have, leave the nets and come follow me. But we find is that Simon and Andrew didn't sell their home. They, they didn't get rid of everything. They didn't become monks. They didn't go to the middle of the desert and starve themselves and, become, and take a vow of poverty. No, Simon and Andrew kept their home. So what we find is the fact that what was once Simon and Andrew's home for themselves, when Christ says, follow me, now this home is Christ's home as well. Now this home, it will be used for the service of Christ, for the ministry of Christ. He didn't sell it. He didn't sell all that he had to go follow Christ. He used the possessions now for ministry. So the challenge to us this morning is, do we, with our possessions, with our home, with our finances, with our cars, with our possessions, do we use them for Christ? Or do we begin to separate things? This is Christ's and this is mine. I'll go to church, but don't bring the church to my house. I'll go to church, but don't let the church interfere with my finances. No, no, what we find is Simon and Andrew used their home for the ministry of Christ. And the challenge to you this morning is the exact same thing. Use your home for the ministry of Christ. Invite people into your home. The qualification of elder and deacon is what? That he must be hospitable. If an elder is called to be hospitable, all that's saying is we're all called to be hospitable. So is your home, are your possessions, are they Christ's possessions or are they yours? Because the call to follow Christ wasn't a call to sell everything, to leave the family at home, to forget about everything and just go follow him blindly with no possessions. No, the call was to use what you have for him now, for his glory, for his service. Simon and Andrew's home was for Christ, for his ministry there. And there's no fighting here. They just allow him to use their home. Let's go on. Verse 30. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. Simon's mother-in-law, implying what? Simon was married. You know who Simon is? It's Peter, that great pope, supposedly, to the Roman Catholic Church that started the church. And now what they teach is that popes must take a vow of celibacy. They're not allowed to be married. You already see the contradiction there, right? If Peter has a mother-in-law, therefore he was married. So where does this gift of celibacy come from? Where does this vow of not taking a wife come from? It doesn't start with Peter. So clearly already there's already contradictions in the Roman Catholic doctrine for a pope not taking a wife. Because Peter, their first pope, has a wife and he has a mother-in-law. All that aside, it's a foolish claim. But the reality is this. Peter brings his mother-in-law to Jesus. They brought her. They told Christ. The quick application, do you bring people to Christ? Do you bring your mother-in-law to Christ? Do you bring your sister-in-law, your brother-in-law? Do you bring your friends, your family, your children? Are you bringing them to Christ? Are you like Peter and the rest of the disciples, seeing someone in need, someone who has a fever, someone who's sick and downcast, and saying, you need Christ. Let me take you to Christ. Or are you a stumbling block for Christ? Or do you make it harder for people to come to Christ with all this legalism that you put in front of people before they could come to Christ? The quick application, Simon saw his mother-in-law ill and he saw Christ, the divine one, the one who could heal her from her infirmities. And he says, I'm going to bring my mother-in-law to Christ. The challenge this morning, are you bringing your loved ones before Christ? Are you bringing them to Christ, to the great healer, the great physician of the soul? Verse 31. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve him. 
I won't explain this in too much because this is a bulk of our meditation, but the reality is there's no magic. There's no anointing oil. There's no jackets flying around in the room and people falling back. No, he just lifts her up. He takes her by the hand and she's immediately healed. Luke says that the fever was thrown out of her, rebuked from her, an exorcism of the fever itself. So what we find here is that there's, there's nothing complicated happening. The sovereign one is not struggling to heal those people. What a difference between Christ and the modern day faith healers. There's no testimony of, of her having to recover now. Her having to see if her symptoms will continue. No, she's immediately healed so much so, so quickly that she goes and serves them immediately. The sovereignty of Christ, the ability of Christ. And l- let me stretch this a little bit, okay? You see that there's no mention of Peter's mother-in-law's name. Her. Her. The fever left her. They brought her to him. We don't know her name. In fact, in this culture, rabbis said, would say things like this. God, thanks for not making me a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Because women were not seen of any significance. In fact, as I just said, they were seen as slaves or Gentiles in this day. There was no respect for women. And yet what we see, Christ is completely turning the narrative. In fact, the New Testament turns the narrative on true, don't get scared when I say this word, feminism. True biblical feminism. You want to see what religion really cares about women? Look at Christianity. Because they're the only ones, the true Christianity, not that fake you know, deep south Christianity where they beat their women and stuff like that. No, real Christianity is truly biblical feminism where they esteem the woman. They have the charge for a husband to love the woman. They give the woman an ability to issue a certificate of divorce if need be. That was unheard of in this day. Women had no rights in this day. So if you want to see true biblical feminism, you want to see what real feminism looks like, it's in the New Testament. It's in the Bible itself. Christians are the only ones who have the worldview to truly treat women as a gift of God. As a Proverbs 31 woman, her children rise up and they call her blessed. Only Christianity was teaching that. Now today, we know that there's feminism going, going around, but let me show you how much feminism today truly hates women. There are innocent Children in the womb that are women will be women one day. Will grow up to be a woman who are denied the right to live. That's feminism? Allowing a woman to be deceived that she has the right to murder a woman inside of her? That's feminism? Sending off a woman to work crazy hours while the husband stays at home? That's feminism? Listen, today's culture is lying to you women on what true femininity is. They're lying to you. They're selling you a bill of goods. This is heavy to preach in this culture. People receive death threats for this type of preaching in this culture. But the reality is that Christ cares about women. He cares about you and the true feminine uh, personality that you have. For he's the only one who treats women as they ought to be taught. Listen, you read all of most religious literature, okay? The women aren't even talked about half the time in in those religious literatures. But Christianity constantly addresses the woman, the woman, the woman, completely contrary to the culture of the first century. We don't know her name, but Christ cared about her enough to heal her. True biblical feminism, as opposed to the feminism that we're lied about today in this world. It's heavy, it's heavy stuff. That's a rabbit trail, so let's let's keep going on. <clears throat> Verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Clearly here, that evening, it's still the Sabbath. Who knows, maybe 9 p.m., 10 p.m. The reason they're starting to come in the evening is because in that day, the, the rabbis taught that the Sabbath was from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. So Saturday night, the Sabbath was technically over. So that's why now you see at evening, the multitudes coming to the door, 
1,500 people lived in Capernaum where this was. 1,500 people. I don't think that 1,500 people came to the door. I think all that scripture is saying here is using the word all as in there were a lot of people coming to him. There were many people coming to him in the night, all coming to be healed by this man. All coming because they heard of a man who could heal. They heard of a man who in the synagogue that morning rebuked a demon to come out of a man. So they're brought. And the application again is simple. Healthy people must help unhealthy people travel. Right? You have a lame person. You have a person who's blind. You have a person who has a broken foot. A person who hasn't been healed. A person with a fever. They're not traveling alone. They're not just going to get in their car and drive themselves to Christ. No, they're not able to even make the journey. So what was needed? Healthy family members. Healthy friends. So the application is simple. If you are spiritually healthy, the unspiritually healthy people are going to need you to bring them to Christ. They're going to need you to communicate the gospel to them. If you're spiritually healthy this morning, you have a duty. You have actually a command to preach the gospel to the unspiritually, sorry, unhealthy spiritual people this morning. They're bringing people to Christ. They know of a, of a man who could heal them, and they bring them to Christ. Do you know of a man that can save? Do you know of a Savior that can save sinners? Then bring people to that Christ. You being spiritually healthy. Verse 34. Sorry, let's read verse 33. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Verse 34. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Really quick. Many were saved. That isn't to say that 100 people came and 80 were saved, so many were saved. 80 out of 100, that's pretty good. No, it's saying many as in a lot a huge multitude, all that came to Christ, all that were able to come to him, he saved every single one of them. No no uh, missing the shot. He was perfect on every single person that came to him. Again, how different is Christ in the modern day faith healers? Christ can come, all of, all of them can come to him and he'll heal every single one of them accurately and rightly and perfectly. And there's something else to be said. Here, the text, and all the texts, there's always a distinction made between the sick and the demon possessed. And as we know in our culture, especially American Christianity, what they try to say is if you're sick, it's because you're demon. There's a demon trying to cause you to be sick. Or there's a demon who's influenced you and now giving you a fever. No, the Bible doesn't teach that. There's always a distinction made. If you're sick, that's health concerns. If you're demon possessed, that's spiritual concerns. But there's never a mixing of the two. There, there isn't. It's always a distinguishing of the sick and the demon possessed as we see in the verse. So don't let today's culture think, man, if I have a fever, oh, this is saying definitely trying to you know, infiltrate my life. No, it's just a fever. It's just a fever. So that's the application. It's not simple, right? That's the exposition. It, it's, it's simple. It's easy. It's a story about Christ coming to the home and healing. Christ coming to the home and dealing with the woman and healing with her in a kind way. About many people coming to the door and being healed by Christ. Some application in there. But here, let's get to the, to the heart of the matter. And this is what I really want this morning for us to meditate on, to, to revel in the majesty of Christ, the glory of Christ. Listen, whatever you do in this life, it should be done for the glory of Christ. So what we need is a bigger vision of the glory of Christ if we're going to do anything for Him. So there's five things I want to cover in our application. Number one, He's available. Christ is available. Number two, Christ is tender. Number three, Christ is able and willing. Four, He's for the lowly and outcast. And five, He merits a response. Number one, He's available. Think of this day. It's still the same Sabbath. He just preached, and preaching is difficult, especially if you're Christ. He preaches with energy and vigor and zeal and passion, and so much so he has to perform an exorcism in the service, which, as you know, is not an easy task. In fact, Christ says, if you, when he tells his disciples, if you do this, don't do it alone. Take two or three. Go. It's, it's a difficult task. So Christ is preaching. He's performing exorcisms, and yet he's tired. It's been a long day he spent. He's been doing all this ministry, and he finally gets home to the house of Simon and Andrew. Possibly, picture the scene in your head, he's finally going to throw himself and just relax for a little bit. 
And yet Peter comes and he says, my mother-in-law is sick. Christ doesn't get up. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I have a little more energy with me. Listen, are you irate? Are you easily irritated when you're tired? You know, when you finally get home from work and and, and your child comes up to you, your wife comes up to you, do you have that short response? Because you're nothing like Christ, if so. But the fact is that Christ is available. He's accessible. There's no hindrance on Christ's part. There's nothing in Christ that's wrestling within him him to be impatient with Peter's mother-in-law. In fact, Christ invites this. As opposed to Christ not just being tired and being available, he invites us, he lures us, he commands us to come to him. Listen, he is available, he is accessible, he is reliable. He cares for Peter's mother-in-law and all those who were at his door when he's dead, tired, slaving away through the whole day, yet they come and he receives them. Let me ask you, Are you making use of his availability? When you pray, do you pray for your children knowing that he's accessible and available? When you pray for your unconverted family, do you pray knowing that he's listening and he's accessible and he's not too tired and he's not too weary to hear your prayers? When you're up at 3 a.m. and you can't sleep because you're stressed and you're anxious and you're battling sin, do you pray at 3 a.m. knowing that Christ isn't waking up to hear you pray, knowing that he's not too tired to hear you pray, knowing that he ever liveth to make intercession for you? Do you pray to this available Christ? Listen, when we don't make use of the availability of Christ like we see in the text, it's like we're stranded on a desert island with a thousand phones that work around us, and yet we sit there and we just prefer to die on that desert island. That desert island not only has phones, it has food, it has a camp, it has wood, it has everything you need on that deserted island, and you think you're going to die there because you're not going to survive. That's what it's like when you don't make use of the availability of Christ. You're not on the desert island. You have the king of kings' ear. You have his mind, his heart for you. If you're in him. So come with all your cares. Cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. Whatever it is. If it's in his will, he will answer accurately. Your marriage, your children, your unconverted family, your your worry about finances, your worry about the future, where you're going to live, how you're going to make next month's rent, all that stuff. Your spiritual cares, your battles with sin. Remember, the next point, okay? Let's go on. I could go on. He's tender. He's tender. Remember what I said, women were low in this culture. The sick and the blind and the lame were always homeless because they couldn't fend for themselves. And yet who does Christ come for? Those very people, a woman and the sick. Christ is not just available. He's not just someone with good intentions. He's also tender. He's loving. He receives them. He hears from them. He hears their sickness and he heals them. A king with all the power and all the royalty and all the riches. And yet he has that for you, dear saint. He has that for you. Not just available to you, but for you. And you come to him. So not only is he available, as we saw in the text. Not only is he tender as he receives the outcast. But he's willing and he's able. Could you imagine if he was available and he was tender but he had nothing to give. You come to Christ thinking he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the powerful one, the omnipotent one, but yet you find out he has none of that. That would be so worrisome, but the reality is this. He's not just available. He's not just hoping to help. He's not just available to help. He's not just willing to help, but he's able to help. He is able to help. Do you believe this, honestly? Because I know we say we believe this stuff. But do we functionally believe this? Do we live like we believe this? Do you pray like this? Or do you have little faith when you pray? Do you pray like one who was able to heal the women instantly? Do you pray uh, uh, to the one who can cast out demons with just one word? Think about it. Do you really pray like he is omnipotent? Do we make use of the availability and the tenderness and the omnipotence of Christ? If you're battling sin, he's able to get you to overcome that sin. 
if you're struggling in any area of the Christian life, whether that's pride, anxiety, bitterness, anger, impatience, your marriage, your kids, your zeal, your discipline, your lack of reading, your lack of study, your lack of evangelism, whatever it is, as quick as he was able to heal that woman that night, he's able to heal you and to deliver you from your sin and to give you a fire within your breast to go out and preach the gospel and to study his word. But do you believe this? Do you see this Christ and think, that's a cool story? Or do you see this Christ and think, he's available to these people? He's available to them. He's tender toward them. And he's able for them. When you pray, are you praying like this? I know sometimes I battle and I've been praying for some of my unconverted loved ones for years and years and years. And I think, Lord, are you able to save them? Because it feels like you're not. Well, that's a lack of faith on my part because he is able to save to the uttermost. When you come and you kneel at the throne of grace, pray to this Christ, to this available Christ who hears you, to this tender Christ who receives you, to this able Christ who's able to deliver you from the power of darkness and the dominion of of the evil one. And as we said, he's for the low. Some of you guys might be too high for Christ. What do I mean by that? You, You don't see your need for Christ. You're like that Pharisee who went to the wall to pray and said, Lord, thank you for not making me like those other sinners. Thank you that you've made me good, you've made me kind, you've made me giving. You might be too high for Christ. But in the text, we see that none are too low for Christ. He comes to the outcast. He comes to the downhearted. He comes to the low, the contrite of spirit. He comes for sinners. He comes for women and men who are nothing in this world. Not for the noble, not for the rich. He could save them too, but he comes with his eye toward the lost sheep. So you might be too high for Christ, but in this text, none are too low for him. None are too low for him. If you're feeling like you've been sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and failing him, know that you aren't too low for him. He loves to save the low of heart. Christian, this morning, think of God's providence in your life. Providence is what God has orchestrated through his wisdom and put people in your life and taking people out and giving you jobs and taking away jobs. It's everything that God is doing according to his will to get you on a path. Consider what he's done to find you. Consider how he's made himself available for you, tender for you, omnipotent for you. Because when you consider these things, He merits a response. Look at verse 31 again. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and these beautiful words, and she began to serve them. She began to serve them. This is an expression of gratitude, of thankfulness for what just has happened. Imagine the day. She's been laying in bed all day, probably not able to go to the synagogue, not able to hear Christ preach. She's in bed. She's weak. She's frail. She can't even move that they need to bring her to him. And they get home. Picture it in your mind. I'm making this up, but picture it. Christ is in the living room, as it were. And then Simon and his wife and Andrew are in the back room talking to the mother-in-law. You wouldn't believe what we just saw. You wouldn't believe what we just saw. He just preached. And everyone was amazed. He just cast out a demon. And everyone was amazed. There might be hope for you, Mom. You might not die today. You might be saved today, Mom. Let's take you to him. Picture that in your mind. And then she's healed. Christian, he's healed you. He saved you by dying for you, by purchasing you with his own blood. You were bought with the price, the precious blood of the lamb. He was sacrificed for you. He lived for you. He died for you. He was raised for you. And now the command for you is what? To come to him. But now to serve him. To serve him. To use your hands and your feet that have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb for his service. To use your intellectual abilities for the study of his word, to use your mouth as a mouthpiece for the Lord to possibly go and even die somewhere. Don't reverse this. You don't serve him to be loved. That's a workspace doctrine. No, 
You serve Him because you've been loved by Him. As an expression of the gratitude of your heart toward Him. Listen, God hates the lukewarm so much so that He spits them out of His mouth. So don't be a lukewarm Christian this morning where you come and you pay your dues as it were on Sunday morning and the rest of the week, it's not for Christ. In my home, it's not for Christ. In my work, it's not for Christ. In my finances, it's not for Christ. In my service to the Lord, in my time, is it for me or is it for Christ? The reality is this. She was captivated by his love that day. She was moved to service because of what he's done for her. You look at all the apostles in the New Testament. You look at all the church history and all those who died at the, at the hands of other sinners. Lady Jane Grey and Hugh Latimer and even the early church fathers with Justin Martyr and all these men. And you look at them and you think, man, they must have had some real gusto. They must have had an extra measure of the Spirit, which they, they honestly might have. But the reality is that the same Spirit that's in them is in you this morning if you're in Christ. So don't look at them as something that you can't attain. Look at them and think they were acting out as an expression of gratitude for what Christ had done for them. They were living their Christian life knowing if Christ has done this for me, then I can do anything for him. Wake up this morning, Christian. We sin daily. We fail him often, yet he still keeps us in his love. Great is his faithfulness. He heals us, as I said. How can you not be moved in your soul this morning? How can I not be moved in my soul this morning? Out of service to the majesty of Christ. Listen, there's so many times when I, you know, just going, driving home, going through life, and I reflect on, you know, what others have done for me, what my parents have done for me. And I even, I'm moved to call my parents and be like, hey, thank you for what you've done. You know, I appreciate all the hours you put in and the hard work you put in to, to give me a life that, you know, was much better than yours. And I, I'm moved to that because I reflect on the compassion that they had toward me. There's even times with Augie, my, our, our son, when he's going to bed and he's throwing a fit and he doesn't want to go to sleep. And I try to tell Augie, Augie, think of all that we've done for you today. We took you out to play at the park. We gave you candy. We bought you things. How can you not be moved to compassion and want to go to bed right now for your parents? Right? And that's trinkets and trikets. That's little things. Listen, the reality is that there's nothing sadder than seeing what someone has done for you and spurning it in their face. Nothing sadder. Just this week, I heard about a story uh, in China where this uh, missionary was there. Obviously, you know it's illegal to be in China as a Christian and to be evangelizing. And his own guy, his own guy on his side, sold him out. And he was arrested for that. And now he has to come back to the States. And actually with this orphanage, it's, it's so sad. They bring in orphans at the age of, you know, one, two, whatever, childhood age. And until they're 18, they take care of them. They feed them. They clothe them. They educate them when their own parents didn't want them. When society in China considers orphans as expendable, nothing, leave them there. And they bring them in, these people. And at the age of 18, they give them the opportunity. Do you want to stay with us and serve here with us, or do you want to go on? Most cho choose to go on without even a word of thanks for these, to these people. But the saddest part isn't that. The saddest part is they go on and they inform the authorities of what just took place the last 12 years. Could you imagine that? Taking care of someone since they were children to the age of 18, and then going out and telling the authorities on these people who just saved your life. There's nothing sadder. But dear believer, reflect on this. See the love of Christ on your behalf when he dies on the cross for you. And yet you aren't moved to compassion and zeal and fire for him. There's something to be said there. There's something to be said there. How aren't you moved to holiness? How can you savor sin more than you savor Christ himself? considering what he's done for you, given his life for you, stands in heaven making intercession for you even now, will plead his blood for you on that great day of judgment on the day to come. He saved you, he's saving you, and he will save you. He'll carry you to, on into eternity. And yet we sit here day in and day out, unmoved, lack of zeal, 
and no service for our king. Unbeliever, as I said, the saddest scene is to turn away the love that someone has given you. As I said, those Chinese are orphans, saw the love that was displayed, and they go and they spurn that love. Let's go back to verse 34. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Not everyone who was healed that day, not even everyone who had a demon removed from them that day were saved. Could you imagine that scene? Imagine the scene that night. You look out your window all these people, are, this whole mob is going to this one house and they're yelling, we know a guy, we know a guy who can heal you. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go. So you just go alongside, you come alongside and you're at the door and you see this man healing people, having compassion on people. It's maybe 12 a.m., 12 a.m., 1 a.m. in the night and you see him still laboring, still fighting, still being tender. And now it's your turn to go forward and you take his sickness before him and he heals you of your sickness. And you walk away and think, I'm so glad I went to that man to get healed of my sickness. And you go home. And you might reflect on it for a couple weeks, maybe a month or two, but that's it. Can you believe what the day of judgment is going to be like for those who were healed by Christ that day? And they stand before God the Father, and the God, the, God the Father says, My Christ, my son, healed you. He touched your leg. He touched your eyes. He spoke the demon to be rebuked from you. And you spurned his love. Listen, those people are going to face such guilt and weight of shame on the day of judgment because they were with the Christ, healed by the Christ physically and remained unmoved in love toward him. And my my challenge to you this morning, Christian or unchristian, believer or unbeliever, The same sense is going on right now. You're not experiencing the physical healing, but you're hearing of the healing. Some of you know the spiritual healing that's taking place in your heart. Don't leave that place. Don't leave the house of Christ unmoved in love, unmoved towards service, unmoved to submission to His will. Come to Christ and sit at His feet and love Him. May may we be a church this morning who's captivated by this lover, because of his love for us. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you that your Son was available, available to the low, available to the outcast, available to the sick, available to the needy, available to those whom society had considered outcasts and nothing. Thank you for Christ's availability. Thank you for his tenderness. But Lord, most of all, thank you for his omnipotence, Lord, that was able to heal physical healing, was able to remove demons, Lord. But now, for us, is able to heal us spiritually, is able to transfer us, transfer us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his Son, And Lord, now as we begin to partake of the Lord's Supper, may we see the elements as a physical display of the love of God in Christ Jesus for sinners, the broken body and the blood shed. And now we may partake of this means of grace and be compelled